business as usual. It got us pretty far. Budgets were developed over there with budgeting tools and data. Plans were made down here with planning tools and data. And rates were managed way over there with rate tools and data. Our analysts spent most of their time building custom spreadsheets using business logic that only they knew. But the utility industry is changing faster than ever before with evolving regulations, technologies, and customer expectations. Our continued success depends on making complex, high-stakes decisions and ensuring timely recovery of our investments. Yet business as usual, with all its disconnected tools, data, and processes, was slowing down our decisions, delaying our cost recovery, and obscuring the strategic implications. That's why we implemented UI Planner. UI Planner is a set of modeling tools for financial planning, budgeting, fixed assets, regulatory, and revenue. Each solution gives analysts a powerful, easy-to-use rules engine that can help us transform huge amounts of data into useful information. With each module we added, our analysts became more efficient while their forecasting and analysis became more robust. As an end-to-end -end integrated solution, UI Planner has transformed our business as usual. It's a one-stop shop to model and manage information for various objectives across the enterprise. So, it enables us to explore all the what-ifs from all sides of the equations quickly and easily, producing one version of the truth that helps us make better, faster strategic decisions, improve our return on investments, and free up our analysts to spend less time on clerical work and more time being analysts. UI Planner is an industry best practice. It's designed, sold, installed, and supported by a team of experts with many decades of combined industry experience. And the majority of our industry already uses it. With UI Planner, our teams are working with shared data and connected, transparent processes and rules. Our models factor in more data with more detail, giving us more insight than we ever thought possible. We create accurate automated rate filings, which accelerate our return on investment. And our IT team loves that our business people are self-sufficient, lowering our total cost of ownership. UI Planner enables us to turn our modeling capabilities and the analysts who drive them into some of our most valuable assets. Whether we're making a major strategic decision or just preparing for the next board meeting, we have the information we need and a clear view into all the what ifs at our fingertips, informing better decisions as we continually adapt to a changing industry. To learn more about how UI Planner can help transform your business as usual, visit our website or give us a call.
Hello, I'm Tom Kuhn, President of EEI. We are now at the conclusion of our EEI's Virtual Leadership Summit. I hope everyone has enjoyed it and found it valuable. I want to extend our special thanks to Oracle Utilities and Utilities International for sponsoring this closing session. And to all our sponsors for their support, which has allowed us to offer this valuable content free of charge. As a reminder, our entire summit will be available online for the next 30 days. Please encourage your colleagues who did not attend to drop by our virtual conference center and check it out. There is no better way for us to stay connected while the pandemic lingers. Our closing session traditionally brings together the CEO leadership of EEI which has been a crowd favorite at past conventions. It's a privilege for me to introduce the leaders of EEI. Before we start, I want to pause to recognize a man who has been a tremendous leader for our industry and for EEI, Chris Crane, our immediate past chairman. When we had to cancel our meeting in Austin in June, we were deprived of the customary passing of the leadership baton on the big stage so we will have to make a do here in the digital world. Rest assured, Chris is the real deal, a leader who gets the job done and inspires us all to be better. Being elected EEI chairman is a major tribute. It says you have the respect and admiration of your peers. As chair, Chris presided admirably over many challenges, including the early days of this terrible pandemic. I know we can't do a standing ovation, but I do hope everyone tuning in will send good thoughts to my friend and a great champion for our industry, Chris Crane. You already have met the new boss, EEI Chairman Ben Folk. He has a supremely capable cabinet of vice chairs, Jerry Anderson of DTE Energy, Warner Baxter of Amaran, and Pedro Pizarro of Edison International. So with that, let me turn it over to Chris, who will moderate our closing general session roundtable. Thank you so much, Tom, and thank you for all the support that I got from EEI leadership and staff when I was chairman of EEI. And we are so blessed to have an industry with such great leadership that's on this uh, virtual call today, leading the industry and continuing to drive our industry forward to support the customers and what the customers need is clean, affordable, uh, reliable energy. And we've got the right team at EEI and the leadership to be able to continue to drive that forward. So thanks, Tom, and appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to have this time for conversation. Ben, as the new chairman, you have, um, you have uh, quite a few goals that you want to set in place. Um, COVID recovery is one that you probably didn't pick at first. But, but now that you're, uh, you're in the seat, you've got it. You've got the clean energy push. Um, we've talked a little bit about the wind turbine behind you. We, uh, we understand the focus of you, not only as um, uh, a leader in your company, but a leader in the industry on clean energy mm -hmm. and taking meaningful steps to deal with the social and racial injustice. So let's talk about your goals and, and let you have time to, to explain to the uh, industry where you are going to take the industry. Yeah, well, you, you, you teed it up really well, uh, Chris, and thanks for your leadership. Uh, big shoes to fill. You said it, though. COVID is something that uh, uh, we have to deal with, and it's a, it's a major issue. I'm really proud of how the industry is dealing with it and, and how we're staying safe, even as we get the lights back on in just a tremendous storm and wildfire season. So uh, I didn't come in with that goal. Uh, I didn't come in with the goal of uh, addressing racial injustice either, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, what I was really thinking about is the clean energy transition and the innovation that I see that needs to take place. I mean, uh, our industry, uh, my company, uh, we, we've, we've done a lot to reduce carbon, and renewable energy's played a big role in that. Uh, but at some point, uh, as we all know, uh, the big grid does get saturated. You can only have so much renewables on the big grid. And, and for us and for, I think, many of our companies, it'll be a big part of our 80% carbon reduction goal by 2030. And 
and our, our no carbon by 2050 goal, and so many people have similar goals, but the big grid does get saturated. And that last 20% of carbon is going to require technologies to be commercially and economically viable that, that aren't today. So we need to start investing today and nurturing those technologies so they can be ready for tomorrow. And I think it's really important that we're out there continuing to lead and reduce carbon while at the same time thinking about those long-term goals that will require different technologies. So I mentioned that was the uh, that was the initiative I really wanted to push, and I'm really proud of what our industry's accomplished, what we're going to accomplish in the next 10 years, and what we can accomplish in the decades to come with the right uh, policy frameworks. Um, but, you know, Chris, the killing of George Floyd happened right in our backyard. We're headquartered in Minneapolis. Uh, it impacted me very personally, as I'm sure it did uh, many, many of uh, our members. It's pretty hard not to be impacted by it. And, it really gave me an opportunity to, to reflect and to realize there's more uh, I can do as a CEO. There's more that I think the industry can do. It's not to say we haven't done some good work, but let's do more. Let's make a difference in our communities. Uh, let's do a better job hiring and uh, retaining and promoting people of color. And there's a lot of best practices out there. Your com company has some of them that we're looking at, but I think as an industry, we can come together and really adopt the more best practices to make a difference there. And of course, I've said it many times, you know, uh, my company is only as healthy as our communities, and we need to be there for our communities. And there's things we can double down on, I think, and make a real difference. It's going to be a journey. There are no quick fixes to this. It's, it's been a long problem, a uh, long-term problem. But I, I do think if we come together, just like anything else we tackle as an industry, we can make a big difference. No, I agree, and I think that that's fantastic, and we appreciate your leadership. Jerry, uh, for you, DTE is reinventing itself from its coal history, um, you know, and, and you're moving the company forward in this clean, um, this clean future. So um, how did it all start, and where does it go from here, Jerry? You know, Chris, we uh, we first started investing in renewables about a decade ago, in right in the heart of the last uh, Great Recession. And uh, we invested heavily for a period, but I'd say the next big push for us came in the clean power plan discussions that were five years ago now, started in 2015. I was uh, sort of in the middle of that, uh, given my role as EEI's environment chair. And I know I thought it's going to be hard for me to advocate one way or another unless I understand what our company can really accomplish. And so we put pencil to paper and and I think figured out that we could take out more carbon affordably given what was happening to gas and renewables that maybe we had thought before. Well, of course, we worked that through and it was just four years ago, about now, that the clean power plan was enacted. Uh, but then it was set aside pretty quickly, as you know, in the wake of the uh, 2016 election. and. At that point, I was just inundated with questions from stakeholders on all fronts about whether things were going to go backward. Were we really going to use, you know, more coal and so forth? And in early 2017, I pulled my leadership team together and, you know, we became of one mind that this was a real issue that we needed to own. And so in early 2017, we came out with our first voluntary commitment. Uh, we, we again put pencil to paper and determined that we could do what science was acting at that, asking for at that point, which was an 80% reduction by uh, 2050. So we committed to that voluntarily. I was kind of stunned by the attention that it got. It was covered by some 150 journals around the world. But I think that was just a sign of how much angst there was uh, at the time on this issue. Well, of course, in the wake of that, um, so many of our companies uh, now have commitments, very fundamental commitments about carbon reductions. We've made incredible progress. Uh, IOUs are down 45% versus 2005. Um, so we've made a lot of progress. We've evolved our commitment twice since then. And our most recent is net zero by 2050 and 80% by 2040 and 50% by 2030. And I've got to tell you, Chris, um, that commitment is towing the strategic boat at DTE Energy. Just so much of what we are doing and so much of our strategy is now defined by that clean energy transition. 
I think as an industry, uh, we've learned that what looked so challenging a decade ago now really looks like an opportunity uh, to transition much of the economy to electricity, uh, to grow fundamentally in the process and, and do something that we'll all really be proud of. So um, challenging for sure, but a, a great opportunity. I think, I think 10, 12 years ago as an industry, we couldn't see a path forward. And, and then we started to work together as an industry to figure out that path. And you've been a great leader as all the leadership at EEI has been uh, in the member companies. So it's been fantastic to see, no, not here, but yes, we can. Um, none of us know what 2021 is going to bring in Washington and how that will change the landscape. But, um, you know, um, we, we've talked a lot about natural gas being a bridge, and that's not really accepted by many um, as being a viable option uh, in some communities, but it is an option that has a reduced uh, carbon footprint and, and it's something that we need to really depend on for reliability. Pedro, California has experienced its first uh, rolling blackouts uh, since uh, the crisis 20 years ago. Give us your insights into the outages and what might be the solution? Uh, are there lessons for others of us to learn here and how can we manage the system in situations like this? There were natural disasters going on at the same time, which some of us don't have the uh, impact from, but um, what, what, what can we all learn from this? Yeah, uh, it has been a challenging period for California, for sure. And we saw the first rotating outages in two decades, really since the energy crisis. Uh, a number of factors came together. And let me just acknowledge that the state is still investigating this and I think there'll be more lessons learned. But a few of the things that, that we saw come together, first was weather. And, you know, it's appropriate to follow this, have this follow the uh, comments from Jerry, because we think that climate change played a role. We saw not only heat, but we saw a heat dome across the entire Western United States uh, that was really unprecedented. You know, sometimes when you see these, uh, you might see them a little lower scale, or you might see them a shorter duration, four or five days. This was a two week heat dome across the West. And so weather was, was part of this. We saw more coincident peak across utilities inside California. We saw more of the other Western states needing their own resources. And so that decreased the imports into the state. Uh, we saw the renewable and the gas fired resources generally operate as you'd expect. There's variability to wind. And there was one hour where you know, wind was not as strong as we would have hoped, but you know, it's within the natural uh, volatility of that. Uh, same with solar. We, there was a, one major gas plant that was lost. Uh, you know, we are reminded as we go through this that the system planning criteria really across the country uh, typically use a one in 10 probability loss of load, sort of loss of load once every 10 years. And it may be that when all, you know, it's studied and understood, this may have well been a one in 10 or perhaps an even deeper than one in 10 uh, event. Uh, but I do think that a lesson for us is that as the California system changes, uh, and I think many of our other systems across the country will change this way, as we see more renewables, uh, it's not the renewables that did this. And it's been unfortunate to see some of the press that immediately goes towards saying uh, California's push for addressing climate change and using renewables was the culprit here. Uh, I don't think it was, but I do acknowledge that having a more renewable dependent system then requires some different parameters for the system, including much more storage. Uh, and also we believe that this will call all of us to revisit our planning reserve margin criteria for the long run, because with a more volatile system, a system that has more uh, intermittent resources, we need a little bit more safety margin there. Uh, you know, I, I, final point I'll make on this, Chris, is that this is consistent with the analysis we've been doing over the last few years uh, when I became CEO in 2016, one of the first things I commissioned was a study of, of how California could meet its climate change objectives economy-wide in a way that makes sense for the economy. And you know that led to a conclusion that it's a clean energy-led pathway uh, that does have clean energy, does have renewables, but it importantly needs to have a lot more storage built into the system to provide that shock absorber. 
so that we can use a clean energy to then electrify a lot of society. So more lessons to come, but uh, I want to make sure that folks focus on there is definitely some changes that come out of this, but it should not be viewed as a reason to step away from the clean energy transition we are also committed to. Yeah, that, that's, that's a fantastic. And I know you've been deeply involved with um, EPRI and other organizations, the Department of Energy on looking at potentially life beyond lithium ion and other storage methodologies that can be uh, more economically dispatched. So we appreciate your, your fantastic leadership in that area. You're, you're one of the brainiacs of the industry. So we're, we're glad to have you on the leadership team and, and be able to, to support. Yeah, I don't know about the brainiac part, dorky scientist maybe, but <laughs> leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, Warner, um, you, you, Warner, you have done uh, a significant job. One of your signature uh, issues at EEI is leading state regulation. And as we are upgrading the system uh, in, in how we um, think that we have to combat um, the changing weather fronts, um, we can't uh, deny that the weather's changing, the storms are becoming much more damaging and dynamic. Um, can the current regulatory regime properly uh, balance the investment that we have to make and maintain a strong balance sheet while serving a customer that's heading much more towards electrification? Yeah. You know, and it's a great question, Chris. You know, it is, it is really a balance in it. And as you said, I think we've all learned here over the years the importance of the investment in infrastructure to have that more resilient grid, that more reliable grid, that cleaner grid. And so consequently, you know, we need to make sure that we have regimes, frameworks, that, that clearly can support those investments um, and to be able to react to the really our customers' needs. Our customers have been loud and clear that they want uh, cleaner, more reliable, more resilient. And so, you know, we collectively as an industry have been working hard to make sure that we have policies in place to support those investments in a timely fashion, uh, to make sure that we have the balance sheets and the cash flows to support the billions of dollars that we spend. It was an industry, we spend over $100 billion per year for this, for this grid. And so it has been a work in progress I think if you look back over the last several years, Chris, I think we've made good progress as an industry. Uh, you've seen, I would say, changes in the regimes to support the types of things that we know are so uh, critical to bring the value to our customers. Yet at the same time, you know, this is this is not an area that we can we can let up on, uh, because if you know one moment we we let up, you know, we the grid is consistently aging. And, uh, and the customer's expectations continue to go higher. And so we too need to be out there very uh, proactively as an industry, as companies, as leaders, explaining you know, why this is so important to, to key stakeholders. And ultimately, you know, when, you, when you step back and, 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 and if we put the customers at the center, right, in terms of where we are delivering value, that this is what they want, you said earlier, clean, reliable, affordable, well, we do all these things. And at the same time, as you know, when we make these investments, you know, we're also creating thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs across this, this country. And so, you know, it all, it all fits together. And, and so, so I think we, we, we've made good progress. Uh, it, it is, you know, the, the frameworks, I would say, certainly some are better than others. And, uh, and this is where, you know, we as, a, as an industry have come together and say, here are the types of things that we know can really make a step change. Fortunately, I think we've had success, but, um, but we can't let up. You know, I was sitting there thinking about what Ben said a little bit earlier about, you know, he's talking about, you know, the issues that we're dealing with, racial injustices and, and disparities. You think about, you know, what we have an opportunity to do with this infrastructure that we've been talking about. And I know your company is just like mine, like all of ours. You know, when we make these investments, we make them in, in the local community. In, in the suppliers that we use are, are diverse suppliers. We're very focused on that. I think it's a real opportunity that we link what we do every day to serve our customers with an even broader good. I think it's a great opportunity for us. And we need the policies, the regimes to support those types of things. No, that's a, that's a fantastic point. It links right to what Ben said. 
you know, we have underserved communities in all of our jurisdictions. Um, we don't have uh, the best public schools that are teaching the fundamentals to our young adults, um, uh, men and women, people of color, to be able to come into these positions. So all the work that the companies are doing to create um, infrastructure jobs and training programs to give the fundamentals to, to give people an opportunity to change their lives and fundamentally change generations. It's, it's a point that may be lost um, in, in the translation of a rate case. Um, yep, people think great. about rates going up versus what we're doing for the economy. The other part of it is all of us are pushing towards electrification. We're trying to improve the environment and not only the, 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 um, the carbon basis, but just the, the air quality in the communities that we serve and the air quality is really worse in the underserved communities. So um, there's, there's a lot more that has to be done for reliability. The old Katie and Safey top quartile numbers are not gonna cut it when you electrify a whole bus system and the power goes down for eight hours and the buses can't charge before they're supposed to roll in the morning. So we've got new standards coming our way and we have to be ready to invest in it and be able to get the recovery. Pedro, one more for you. Um, you know, you've been leading the charge, Pedro, on um, uh, a lot for EEI on electrification, electrical vehicles. Um, uh, SEC just won the single largest EV charging uh, case, um, uh, the infrastructure plan by any electric company. And for quite a while, the utilities were being held out of EV charging. Um, so as you being uh, a leader, Pedro, in this, in this area for helping us as the industry, what's next? Where do we go from here? <clears throat> You know, thanks, Chris. And this really connects to the earlier comments on uh, the electrification of the broader economy and the use of clean, ener clean energy to decarbonize and to help address climate change. Uh, we view transportation electrification as one of the key tools in that pathway. And in a state like California, something like 50% of the state's greenhouse gas emissions end up relating somehow to uh, transportation, whether directly out of the tailpipe or upstream with emissions. So the decision that we just got approval of from the PUC in the middle of the pandemic, so there's frankly a lot of credit toward PUC in taking this on, uh, establishes a budget of $436 million over the next four years to support around 38,000 charging ports per, for passenger vehicles across SCE's 50,000 square mile area. A significant investment. On the other hand, it's just a little first step on the way to the kind of scale that will be needed to get to the 2030 and 2045 electrification goals. Our analysis is that California will need something like 70% of the uh, 70, 75% of the passenger vehicle fleet to be electric by 2045. So uh, that's, a, that's a big lift uh, for uh, our economy. Uh, with that investment, the PUC made a balanced choice. We had asked for more. We'd asked for support for 48,000 ports. They uh, agreed that we needed urgent action, but also in the context, I think, of COVID and the economic impacts, brought that down just a little bit to have it be a bit more manageable for our customers in the very near term. We're hoping that this will be a catalyst for deploying charging infrastructure in our region and elsewhere in the country, and it's been a real pleasure working with other EEI leaders on our CEO uh, task force on transportation and electrification to, you know, share lessons across the country and help other utilities, uh, you know, get there, uh, you know, in their own states. Uh, there's a lot of challenges we have to address as an industry, Chris. One of them is the locking and tackling of deploying the charging infrastructure as we're doing with this program. And by the way, not just deploying it for people who can afford the, uh, uh, expensive high-end vehicles today, but for disadvantaged communities where it might be the lower end models or second hand models that would be so important to penetrate into communities where not everybody has a garage. And so part of what we're doing in our program is tackle the challenge of multiple unit dwellings and uh, you know public charging so that we can really make this accessible for all. But beyond that core charging piece, in order to really advance transportation electrification, uh, we're going to need you know, new uh, tools for, for example, fleet electrification, right? 
we need, need to collaborate with the owners of those school bus fleets or heavy transport fleets and with the other folks in the broad system who you know serve their needs and then finally as we continue to work through the impacts of COVID-19 uh, we uh, are having to adjust how we do this and so you know what used to be simple walks walkthroughs of sites are now virtual site assessments are now solo walks right to adapting the work that we need to do the blocking and tackling in the near term to the realities of the uh, the pandemic. Uh, final point is that we recognize that there might be a bit of a slowdown in the deployment over the next couple of years, as we see automakers, uh, you know, restore their full production lines after they had some COVID-related impacts to, you know, to to the assembly process. We're seeing consumers who may be slowed down in terms of when they're going to buy the next vehicle. So while there might be maybe a little slowdown in the ramp over the next couple of years. We think that the end terminus, that end goal is the same because electric vehicles are going to be such a key part of uh, you know, all of our progress towards uh, you know, cleaning up the economy. Yeah, it's really fantastic to see how the technology is advancing, even in the light duty trucks uh, that we can all start to, start to dispatch now. So it's been very good. Jerry, um, you have led uh, at DTE and in the industry developing a, a modern, much more diverse workforce. You've come up with some unique programs on re-entry um, for people uh, into the workforce, uh, coming back to being productive and in, in being accepted in life. Um, you know, this is one of Ben's very high priorities coming in as chairman. Um, how would you assess our progress, Jerry, to date? And, and how can we get better? Uh, what, what would your suggestions be to the industry to, to support where Ben wants to bring us? One observation I would have, Chris, is that um, the current COVID impacts on the economy are, are very different from those of the Great Recession. The Great Recession hit large industry and high impact earners or high wage earners. This one ultimately is playing out much more heavily with smaller business and low wage earners. And the low wage earners are exactly those who face the sort of issues that you're talking about. So the one observation I have is we're all gonna have uh, a challenge in front of us uh, to reach into those um, low wage and underserved communities because um, this crisis has really hit those hard. Uh, you're right, we've tried to be creative uh, with re-entry programs, for example, from uh, the prison population in Michigan. Uh, with education programs uh, in the core inner city of Detroit uh, that feeds workforce development. And, and I've really been encouraged uh, by the progress that we've made and the, the bond that that's created for us you know, with, with community leaders in Detroit. But I think um, Ben's uh, emphasis on this at this time um, is exactly right uh, because of what I just described about the impact of COVID and of course the attention that's been uh, brought to racial injustice. And so it's, it's an opportunity for all of us to share what we're learning and, and dig deeper and do more. And I think we'll see that over the course of this year. Hey, hey Chris, if I could, and because DTE's program is really, it's something that's really, sh we all should be proud of. And I think everyone Listening to this, I know everyone on the panel believes that everybody deserves a second chance. And there's a lot of wonderful things to be said, said about this digital age. But one of the downside is, is if, if, you, if you do make a mistake, if you get a conviction, a criminal background, uh, you're going to have a heck of a hard time ever getting a job. And, and I think what DTE is doing is, is really actionably giving people that, that second chance. And it's something we can all take a hard look at. I, you know, I, I think there's a lot of things we do that are unintent that actually create barriers, and that's the that's the sort of hard relook that I think our entire industry and, and industry in general it, it has the opportunity to do. You know, um, just responding to that, some of the listeners may not have some of the background, but uh, we we have a uh, actually a program for tree trimming training uh, within the walls of a, a prison in Jackson, Michigan. That's what Ben's referring to. I have to tell you that some of the most moving moments that I've experienced as a leader at DTE were going inside that prison to hear directly from people who 
thanked you for giving them a second chance. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it took one day of that uh, just to lock me in and say, we've got to make this successful. Um, he is right. Ben is right. Um, everybody deserves a second chance. Uh, people there will tell you, I know I did wrong. I'm remorseful for that, but I want a chance to make good. And uh, we can all help with that. Yeah, it is fantastic what you're doing. Reading, and I, I think getting our message out, um, not only to our customers, but to our communities we serve is important. We're much more than putting electricity down the wires or the pipe. Um, we're part of the communities we serve. It's part yes, of you know, your, if I can, if I can just add to that. You're exactly right. I mean, we are a part of the communities we serve. We've been, our companies have been around our communities for 100 years. And, and we, we, we collectively, as, a, as an industry, as leaders, have a platform you know, that we can, can help work with community leaders and, and they not only initiate these programs, but actually, you know, our, our, our coworkers, and, you know, they want to get behind us and, and help too. And so you, you put this together and you, in our industry, we work so closely together in so many things. I'm absolutely convinced that when we come together and we put our minds at this and we share our best practices, just like we've been doing with what Jerry's doing and what we're doing in Ameren and across the industry, we can have an impact. And it won't be just because we can write checks, because we can do that, but we'll put the sweat equity into it and it'll be on our agendas. And if we're able to set those agendas and keep you know, our teams focused and work with the community leaders, I think we can really make some significant progress. It's fantastic. And EEI's leadership on helping us share the best practices is really helpful too. As part of a tradition um, for this, um, for this now virtual session, there's one last question I'll ask all of you, and I'll start with Ben. And it's always the most difficult to answer, um, but it's the same question we end with every year. Um, what, what uh, Ben, um, starting with you, and we'll go across the whole leadership team, what are the things that are really keeping you up at night? What are the big things that are lur lurking around the corner that uh, may warrant more attention than they're getting right now? It's an, always an impossible question to answer, but we love to <laughs> Well, no, it's a, it's a good question. And I mean, I, I think traditionally what keeps me up uh, is, you know, public policy. Um, you know, I like to say with a stroke of a pen, our fortunes can be changed for the better or the worse, uh, quite honestly. Uh, and then safety, both employee and public safety. I mean, it's that's mission critical, and and you know, we I think the whole industry has been focused on that, but we we have to always stay focused on that, and and we do. You know, lurking around the corner, you know, Chris, I, I think I think there's opportunities and challenges. You know, you touched upon, for example, natural gas and, and nuclear, maybe not uh, popular technologies with all the environmental community, but the reality is I, I worry that perfection might get in the way of, of the great. And our industry is making a lot, a lot of progress, but if we make our product uh, unaffordable or worse, uh, not reliable, then I think the clean energy transition is going to come to a, a, a slowdown or a halt. And it doesn't have to. Uh, maybe that's back to public policy, but um, we need to keep moving forward. We need to work on those technologies, as I mentioned. But when I hear people that don't want to see gas, uh, any gas be uh, built or used, even though one day it might, those same plants might use hydrogen, uh, then they don't understand that either we don't shut down carbon intensive plants um, or we take a lot of chances with reliability and that can have devastating consequences because our society needs electricity more than ever. So I worry about that and I guess the final thing I would say and I think this is an opportunity and a challenge is some of the things we're, we're, we all see out there and this our nations become polarized. Um, we don't listen very well to each other anymore um, and I think that uh, that can create a lot of uh, bad things for industry and, of course, what we're trying to accomplish. That's the challenge. The opportunity is we are in the communities. And I think through this COVID-19 crisis, 
Uh, I think we've seen our customer satisfaction scores improved. I think people, are, you know, they like the comfort and they like what we're doing in their backyard. So I think as an industry, we can really rally to maybe bridge some of this polarization and really show that big business can also come with big solutions. So uh, that's good. Gary, I'll punt it to you. Well, I'd start by saying I'm executive chairman now, so I, I sleep more than I used to, and Jerry Narcia <laughs> sleeps less than he used to. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, two things strike me, Chris. One is, uh, and I already mentioned, it's the aftermath of the, of the uh, current crisis. Um, we're deeply involved in both economic and workforce development, and Michigan had made such a great comeback after the last economic crisis that uh, we're going to have some work to do, especially with small business in, in the wake of this. So that's on our minds for sure. Uh, and the second thing that uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about is the clean energy transition. We're watching the upcoming election really closely. Um, if we get a flip in the presidency and a uh, flip in the Senate, uh, this will be a key near-term priority uh, for both Congress and the president, I think. Um, and so we're, we're watching that carefully. I concur with Ben that I think as we work through policy related to uh, climate, we need a new narrative uh, for what that transition is really gonna look like. Um, we're all committed to it. Uh, we're clearly committed to getting to net zero as fast as we can, but the path is gonna look different um, than some presume. And we've, we've got to understand that, uh, be clear on it, uh, and then go get it. Thanks, thanks. Hey, Joe. <clears throat> well, I'm going to start with safety, uh, because it really starts there with our worker safety, but also our public safety. And in our status, you know, we've been dealing not only with COVID, which, you know, all of us have been dealing with, but the issues of wildfires uh, have been top of mind. So that definitely one that we continue to focus on a lot. Uh, the second thing I'd say is uh, we are managing all of these challenges, yet we have a long-term vision for how we do our part as an industry for the economy to help, help decarbonize and help you know, manage that clean energy transition. And so I think the, the, the worry point is how do we make sure we can spin all these plates at once and keep an eye on the long-term vision while managing through the near-term challenges? And the mm -hmm. final quick one I'll give you and I think echo some of the others comments. Um, this is a pivotal moment in terms of our country's history as far as the discussion on social equity and social justice goes. Uh, I've been really heartened that the discussion has changed because it changed from any one diverse group, whether it's a black community or it's my Latinx community or any community. It's not just one individual voice, it's all of these voices coming together and looking at how we address systemic uh, injustice in our society. So I'm encouraged, that's the opportunity, but uh, whether it's in how we work with our communities or how we work with our employees, with our teams, um, I wanna make sure that, that we're being transparent, that we're showing where we are today. Last week, we were proud to show our data and you know, provide the good and the bad and you know, where we see you know, needs for improvement. That's a conversation that we need to have not only to get the blocking and tackling right and the goals right, but to make sure that we're capturing the hearts and minds of our teams and our communities, showing the impact that our industry collectively can have on helping move the broader society forward. So I worry about that, but I'm also excited about that. That's fantastic. Warner, it's always good to be last. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I, ditto, right? I'm, I'm done, right? And, you, know, you know, when you're on the road with investors, you get this question all the time. And I always like to say, you know, I, I generally sleep pretty well, but I do toss and turn every once in a while. And, uh, and really, the things that, that we just heard, really all the things that come to mind. Of course, safety is always at the top. And, 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 but you know, when we talk about safety at Amherst, we also talk about security, not just physical security, but then cybersecurity. You know, as we, we've all seen this, this rapid transformation of this digital age, literally within months versus what we thought were going to take years. You know, we know our cyber attack space is, is going to end there. And so, so the, those things that, that really making sure that the energy grid remains secure and we're continue to collaborate, not just among each other, but with governmental agencies and other critical infrastructure industries. And those are things that we have to make sure that we do an effective job. Because as we know, 
the bad players are out there and they continue to grow. But then you go back to many of the other comments that were made, you know, public policy, you know, uh, whether it's energy policy or even economic policy, you know, it's so important. And, 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 you know, we have to make sure that we go from an age of sound bites to sound facts when we were trying to make these decisions, because I think unfortunately we live in a, a sound bite age. And when we're talking about an industry and what we do impacts literally, and our, our investments are decades and decades long and have such a significant impact to the overall economic welfare of our country. And I say that humbly, um, but that's what we, that's what we do. You know, that has to really be done well and done right. And, um, and then, you know, of course, all these issues we've talked about with regard to diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is, this is a big deal. We have an opportunity as an industry to lead in so many different ways. Uh, and, uh, you know, we talk about an airman about our mission to be the power of the quality of life. Well, that's true, Chris, like you said, it, it's, it's about safe, reliable, and affordable energy, whether it's electric or gas. But we have an opportunity. This is our opportunity to, to really play a significant role for our, our communities, our states, our country, to really help lead in so many of these things, including diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we have our challenges, but um, but I got to tell you, I'm, I'm excited about our future. That's fantastic. And I, and I want to thank all of you, not only for your leadership of your companies and what you're doing in the communities and how the narrative of this business has changed um, through all your leadership at your individual companies, but also your dedication to the industry and, and supporting the EEI staff and directing them. And all of us, Ben, are behind you and want to support you in your chairmanship and to make sure it's the most successful. So we appreciate your leadership. I appreciate all of your time here today. And I'm sure this is going to be much more enlightening to those that uh, the membership and those that are listening uh, to this virtual broadcast. And hopefully next year, I'm watching you from the, the peanut gallery while you're all on the stage um, and we're in person together. So I'll be safe. Um, have Keep your families and your companies safe and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Take care. Take care. That brings us almost to the end of EEI 2020, a virtual leadership summit. I want to thank everyone for joining us for our maiden voyage into the digital world, and I hope you have found it worthwhile. I also want to thank all our sponsors again for their important support. Naturally, we do not know what the future holds, but I do know that I sincerely hope to see all of you again next June in Las Vegas for EEI 2021. In the meantime, please be safe and we'll be in touch. At this point, the post-session live chat will begin. Thank you very much.